of the systems issues in terms of people getting in because we have had trouble. Um, okay. And, you know, and Dr. Ewens, your current experience is obviously an example of that, but you're far from the only one. So Tyra, could you just give us a little um, guidance here? Um, sure, I'm not sure. The link seemed to work for several people today. The only thing I could suggest for um, Dr. Ewan is if you attempt to log in or attend as a guest and see if that lets you in. Sometimes if I'm on a personal computer, it will block me. Um, but I would be happy to set something up for you at a separate time so we can do some testing. And I would say if you are on a uh, telephone, star six should enable you to mute and unmute yourself. Um, See, if I pass, normally I just put unmute, unmute with the symbol, okay? Mm -hmm. you know, I did my quarterly staff meeting in the hospital this morning and everything worked. So I'll be happy to follow your guidance to follow up uh, later on. But at this point, I'm going to be on my cell phone. But great job, by the way, on the attendance list. It was so clear who's there, who isn't there. It's just great <laughs> graph. It makes it very simple for us. And everything okay. I can, information, consent form, all that. I, it's all works. I was very puzzled why I couldn't get any three devices. So thank yeah, you. Yeah, that, that's very strange. So we'll definitely set something up offline. And Catherine, I'll make that offer to anyone else that wants to do some testing with me. I can certainly try to figure that out. Great, I think that'd be uh, very good. Um, Dr. Wolf, your hands up. Did you want to say something preliminarily yeah. before we get started? Yeah, Dr. Green, he's listening on my phone. He's uh, got the same problem, so I'll make sure that he connects with Tyra. Okay, all right, good. Um, I will say I had the same problem. I mean, I don't think it's unique to anybody in particular. Um, it, it, Mr. Calico, your hands up. Yeah, I just wanted to make a brief comment. I had the same problem, but then uh, as Tyra suggested, uh, I signed in as a guest and it worked pretty well. OK, well. Well, um, all right. Many of us are having problems. We will continue to try and figure a way to simplify and make it work for everyone. I if I had any say so, I'd move us to Zoom, but. I don't know that that's ever been an option for us. However, let's move on. Um, I would first uh, preliminarily ask anyone who is not talking to mute themselves, please, so we don't have background noise in the meeting. Um, and having called the meeting to order, and, and also when you speak, Please identify who you are so the record can be clear about who's speaking at any given time. Um, and that's basically the essentials at this point. Um, the first item on the agenda is approval of the minutes. Do I have a motion to approve the minutes? Cole Hep moves to approve the minutes. Is there a second? Sour seconds. Okay, are there any uh, board members who are going to abstain from voting on the minutes? All right, are there any board members who are opposed, opposed to approving the minutes? All right, I do not see any responses, therefore the minutes will be uh, uh, reflected as unanimously approved. Um, the Second item on the agenda is public comment. Is there anyone here for um, to make comment to of, of the public who has a public comment? I don't see or hear any responses, so I'm going to assume that there is no one here for public comment. Um, the next item on the agenda is chair updates and the specific topic that we did want to talk about at this meeting um, is what members of the board feel about having in-person meetings or not having in-person meetings. Um, I think our, this is not a decision making discussion, but I think it's a way of, of hearing from everyone as to what people would like and why. Um, 
So I will, I, mean, I don't know, is Dr. Lee here? I don't see him on my list, which is unfortunate because I know he has some thoughts about this, but um, I will say. Uh, if I could just say, I just saw an email from Dr. Lee. This is McEnany talking. I just yes. saw an email from him asking for a link, but we had already received a link. I don't know whether he had received the link to this meeting. Okay, uh, um, so well, we should probably try, try, and and... Is I'll try and forward the link. I'll try and forward the link to him. Um, okay, maybe that'll maybe that'll work. I don't know. That, uh, thank that... you. If you thank you, I'm sorry to interrupt, Catherine. If you could please copy me, that would be great, and I can definitely follow up with him after the meeting. Thank you. Thanks. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so I think the what I've heard, and then I'd really like to hear from everyone else who has thoughts about this, is that there are a number of people on the board who would value the um, or do value having in-person meetings. You know, they're important for actually getting to know each other and working in person is a different sort of experience than working remotely. Um, so there's that. Um, there is also the concern of convenience and especially for people who are uh, a long distance away from Hartford um, or for whatever other reason have difficulty getting to the meetings and back. Um, it's a lot more convenient to have the remote meetings. Um, there you know, there are other concerns that, that I'll just put out there that I don't know which way exactly they weigh. Sometimes our meeting locations when, when we're in the Capitol uh, building are very nice and work really well. The meeting room in the Department of Public Health isn't so nice and is not doesn't work so well. <laughs> the, uh, it, the ability to hear in it is hard. Um, Another consideration, which I really don't know which way it goes, but um, I'll say this for the public. Um, I feel as though it's easier for people to attend when we're remote um, or at least hybrid because they can sign on and don't have to travel to some location to be here. But um, that you know may also there may be the same reasons that people would rather be in person to see you know see people in person so um anyway those are the various things that i think but what you know for and 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 i believe there are a range of possibilities for us we i think may have the ability to do hybrid meetings you know somewhat in person some what one meeting would be both remote and in person but i'm not sure about that um i know some government bodies can um we have the ability to have i think some meetings in person and other meetings remote um i think the primary thing is we have to be very clear where we are and make it possible for the public to attend. So, uh, all right. So, um, who would like to weigh in on this issue? Yes, Mr. Calico. Well, uh, I live way down in Greenwich, and uh, so it, it is a distance, and I have some physical disabilities that prevent me from traveling to Hartford. But on the other hand, uh, when the meetings were held uh, up in Hartford, I was at least able to join by by phone at the time, and um, uh, in, in that case, uh, I was able to participate. So, you know, I, I realize it cuts both ways. I realize some people value the in-person meeting, but some of us would have difficulty traveling. So I prefer the remote meetings, but once again, uh, it, it didn't prevent me when there were meetings in Hartford from attending. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, others? Yes. Uh, Dr. Green, was that your hand or were you just? Uh, we can't hear you. Can't hear you. Uh, 
Okay, well, I don't know what to say. I can't hear you. We can't hear you. Um, uh, Dr. Green, if you have um, at the top of your screen a button that says more, there should be an option to um, you are on mute yourself, or it will be in the reactions option. You on my computer, but we, uh, oh well, we can hear you if that's your phone. But there's a lot of feedback. Let me move on, see if there is someone else who has something to say. Doc, Dr. Green, while you try and get that sorted. Um, Dr. Zeman, are you here? Yes, I am. I, I At other meetings you have. Yeah, well, I, I feel the same way that I would like, you know, I understand that the, the dilemma between <clears throat> in-person and uh, um, you know, uh, online, and I can certainly live with with the online meetings, but but just to have an occasional, you know, in person meeting would be nice. Okay, thank you. Um, and Mr. Andrews, I believe that you had expressed some thoughts previously. I have said that for myself, while I'm not enthusiastic about making it all the way into Hartford and finding a parking place, the technology works very poorly for me. So when we're operating on remote, whether it's my computer, my ears or something, uh, I feel like I'm half participating. So on balance, I would make the effort to go into Hartford. Thank you, thank you. Um, Dr. Katz. Thanks, um, Dr. Katz. I just wanted to say I, I love the convenience of the virtual option. It definitely makes it easy in the middle of a work day to kind of come and go. Um, but I do think we should have in-person, I don't know if it's twice a year or quarterly, um, with the option, it, it would be great if people could still attend virtually, even if there is an in-person option or by, via phone, even if it is an in-person meeting. Um, but I think that might be a good compromise between the two. Thank you. Thank you. Are there others who would like to share thoughts about this? Uh, yeah, and and Max, any just a thought. Um, I'm with Dr. Katz on that. You know, uh, I think uh, it's uh, invaluable for us to get together occasionally. I understand some of the concerns, some people who are at a distance, and so on and so forth. But um, you know, just to be together at uh, right. Are, are you frozen? I think you may have frozen in mid sentence. Our concerns on a particular matter. Um, yeah. If I, uh, can you hear me now? Sorry if I froze. Okay. So what I said was I think it it increases our collegiality to to get together at least occasionally, and uh, for those of us who can, and um, I, I think that's helpful because we'll eventually end up all deciding one matter or another. On that subject, uh, and I don't know where we stand on it right now, with respect to hearings at the Department of Public Health, I think those should be done in uh, person, not remotely. I don't know whether they're still doing them remotely or partially remotely and in person. So if there's an assistant attorney general listing, listening, or <clears throat> I'd like to just mention that that's important also to, to actually see the witnesses and listen to the witnesses when you're making a decision on a matter. 
So those are my thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Uh, that's definitely going to get taken into account by everyone here, including, I think there is someone from the Attorney General's office here. Um, Ms. Jacqueline? Yes, thank you. Um, I can appreciate the, the matter of convenience, and that's not a problem for me because I live in the Hartford region. Um, but I just want to say for people who are concerned about parking, I know I've we've heard concerns um, mentioned previously that um, before COVID, um, when the legislature was not in session, we were able to park in the LLB parking garage, and there is ample parking um, uh, for guests. So that is not a problem. And of course, um, uh, the legislature is only scheduled to meet in 2024 in February, March, and April. So that in, if we're looking forward to the coming year, um, we would be meeting at the LOB and parking would not be a problem. Um, I do understand that parking may be a problem at the Department of Public Health. I don't know if they've cleared that up or not. But again, for the uh, looking forward to the next year, we would be able mostly to, to meet at the LOB and there would be parking. So I just wanted to mention that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Attorney Shapiro. Good afternoon. I just wanted to say that on the, from the attorney general's office perspective, we're happy to attend meetings in person if the board uh, wishes, and we're happy to attend any meetings that are in person as well. Oh, thank you. Um, Dr. Wolf. Uh, yeah, the coming in for some case reviews on odd days at DPH, there's still a, a very limited parking, and I usually end up uh, under the overpass and there are usually not many um, spots left. So that's a problem. The other problem at DPH was the acoustics in that in that main room were terrible. Um, and I would gladly take electronic <laughs> uh, listening to to the, that cavernous echo, which you couldn't you often couldn't hear things. So I think that was a problem. Um, I personally am fine with remote. Um, uh, with both meetings as well as um, as well as hearings, I, I may be antisocial, but and I don't mean to be, but um, uh, but anyway, I find I think it. But I have I'm I'm fine if if the concept is to have uh, one or two meetings uh, in person, but then have the option for people who can't make it uh, for remote would be fine with me. Thank you, thank you. Um... I don't know if there are other people who want to contribute. I see both Ms. Jacqueline and Dr. Wolf, your hands are still up. I don't know if that means you have more to say. <laughs> um, is there anyone else who would like to weigh in at this point? Uh, Dr. Green. Still can't hear you, unfortunately. Can you, do you, are you here on your phone as well as uh, on the computer? Dr. Green, are you on your phone in the meeting? Because you're muted on the phone. Here, I have them, on, I have them on the phone. Okay. Are you? No, I, I, I'm always an advocate of in-person meetings. However, I realize it's difficult for some of the board members to make all the meetings. So I would suggest we have maybe either quarterly or every other meeting in person. I personally like to see the uh, respondents and listen to their attorneys in person. In regard to what uh, Dr. Wolf said regarding hearings, they have to be in person, as far as I'm concerned. I was okay. recently at DPH as a consultant, 
And I, some days parking is easy, and some days it's not easy. Personally, I believe since the board members are doing a public service and not being compensated for their time, arrangements should be made for parking spaces for the board members whenever there is any kind of in-person meeting. Thank you. Thank you. I think, by the way, it was Mr. McEnany who said the hearing should be in person, but it, it, no matter on that, I think they may, the panel hearing any particular matter, I think is empowered, if you will, to decide whether to have a hearing in person or not. And, and, and I would suggest for panels that if you need to be in person or want to be in person, you should express that. Hopefully that can be honored. It's not, I, there may be times it can't, but hopefully it could be. So currently I have um, both Ms. Uh, Dr. Wolf and Dr. Green's hands up, or is either of you wanting to speak? Yes, Dr. Wolf. Yeah, so I, I, Dr. Green may have misquoted me, but I'm fine with remote on hearing panels. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, Anyone else? Does anyone else? I think this we have really covered the territory. I think has been very interesting and I will circle back with our support um, with Tyra and DPH and see what we can figure out to come up with that will respond to all of this. Um, Dr. Zeman. Only to be not to be repetitive, but on a hearing, I really would like it to be in person. I find it difficult to do them on Zoom. I know we have, I have one coming up, I think, in October. And I'm going to communicate with Tyra about requesting that they be in person. Right. How and, can I, the panel members feel on that one. Right. I, I know, look, I, I again, this is a, a juggling act, unfortunately, but. Um, I know that there have been some panel, some hearing days since COVID, since we went remote, that have been in person at the request of the panel or otherwise. I don't know what the logistics of that are. I don't know. I don't know, you know, sometimes the expectation of parties is that it's going to be remote and it gets scheduled on that basis and can't be you know, is that they're not able to be there in person. I, so there are all kinds of considerations, but I think that the pulling, I fully understand, and I'm sure everyone does, the desire to have the in-person. And I think, again, I think the panel, panel involved in any particular matter should be um, expressive about what you would like and see what can be arranged. Um, Dr. Green, are you talking through Dr. Wolf? Not presently. <laughs> <laughs> I cut okay, him off he's... because it's an echo constantly, unless he's actually. <laughs> I think he. He's... I think he's trying to talk right now. Yeah. He, he's he's gesticulating that it's, he's trying it's, to it's talk. It's tempting not to answer. <laughs> One sec. Yeah, go ahead. The reason I think the hearing should be in person, when the panel sits together, we have the opportunity to uh, make sure our notes are similar, that if we have similar questions, we are allowed to talk amongst ourselves, which we can't do on a virtual meeting. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um. All right, is there anyone else? I don't see anyone else at this point. I think this has really been helpful. And I think, uh, as I said, I will circle back with the our people who could make something happen and figure out what we can do, um, what we can do to accommodate all of these different competing interests. Okay, 
um, the next item on the agenda is um, from the Department of Public Health. We had asked at the last meeting that we have the department come to us and tell us about what they do in terms of identifying and uh, and uh, recording on our records when individuals who are licensed in Connecticut are disciplined in other states. Uh, um, so who who is here to speak to us about that? Um, Steve Carragher from the Connecticut Department of Public Health. I manage the uh, the initial licensing unit, and my colleague is here who manages the investigation side of it as well. Um, so I can speak to, and I think the question is with regard to an applicant for a Connecticut license who, for example, is licensed in New York, and they indicate on their application that they have that license, then we would get verification from New York that would provide us with any disciplinary action that either have taken or have not taken it, it would be considered a clean license or not. Um, and then if it was determined that there was disciplinary action taken in the other state, then um, we would follow up with that. If, if there was a like a pending investigation, we couldn't issue a license to that person until the investigation was resolved. Um, if it was action taken um, with regard to standard of care issues, then that would be something that the department would investigate. And I'll let Laura speak to that. Um, but uh, you know, if it was for that they didn't complete their continuing education, they there were some you know minor issues, then the chances are likely we wouldn't pursue any type of discipline. I don't know if that's kind of like what you're looking for from uh, from the licensing side or anything specific. And we and then I should say prior to issuing a license, we're going to get those verifications. We're going to query the National Practitioner Data Bank to see if there are any hits there. And then we're also going to query the Federation of State Medical Boards disciplinary inquiry process. Um, most boards report to that. Um, the well, the only not the only issue, but um, my, many states don't release the fact that they have an open investigation. Um, their laws don't allow for it, um, and they, no states, to my knowledge, reports any pending actions. So if you if you're under an investigation. The state wouldn't report it to the data bank and the state wouldn't report it to the Federation of State Medical Boards until it was resolved and disciplinary action was taken. I don't know if that helps too. Okay, um, I see Dr. Wolf, you have a question. You're muted, Dr. Wolf. Steve, nice to finally meet you after many years. It's been a while. <laughs> um, so I think that's really for us the big issue. It's it's not so much the data banks, but it's the 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 applicants who who are less than truthful or dece or plain out lie about pending investigations. There, from what you said, there doesn't seem to be any possible way to find out from the states during that process until it's a until it's officially adjudicated, even if you could check with the state itself, it sounds like they won't even tell you. Some will, some won't, that's true. Um, and if I had to check with 50 states on every applicant, my workflow would go out the window and you'd be calling right. me and telling me, hey, what's going on? Why is it taking so long? Right. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's a, you know, you gotta take the good with the bad there. I mean, we do use, if you're familiar with the Federation of Credentials Verification Service, that a lot of uh, physicians use to document their core credentials, their medical school, their residency training, their exam, ECFMG certification, et cetera. Um, and on those reports, we sometimes find that people list that they had state licenses, but didn't list it on their application to us. So that's one way we can kind of say, okay, <clears throat> Dr. Wolf, you're applying and you didn't list New York on your, app, on your application, send us a list of all the states that you have a license and we won't issue it until we get that list. And then we get the verification from the other state, but, yeah, I mean, when we verify, when my office verifies Connecticut licenses to other states, if there is a pending investigation, we do report that, that there is a pending investigation. And we also say, we're not going to provide any other details until this is resolved. Okay, but 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 it sounds like not every state does that. That's true. All right. What are there particular states that are a problem? 
that you the off the, offhand? Yeah, they're not a problem until we until we run into the problem. So you know that's kind of the the issue. Right. Um, I can't say off the top of my head. You know, like New York, they report it says there there's no pending charges, no discipline, no pending charges. Other okay. states don't. Um, but I, th to give you a list, I, I don't have a list of them that don't. Right. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, I mean, it's there are like three stages, though. There's investigation, pending charges, and then disciplinary action. And I, I assume getting even, you know, to the lower level of investigation, you wouldn't be getting that normally. Is that right? Um, I would say so. Yes. I mean, I we had an attorney email us in. They have a, a client who is a pending investigation in Massachusetts. I don't know the name of the person and I don't think they've filed an application with us yet. Um, but because there's that pending investigation, we're precluded by law from issuing a license until that gets resolved, which, as you well know, there there could be investigations that are. You know, I don't know what the right word is frivolous or, you know, I filed a complaint because I didn't like the way the doc talked to me and then Massachusetts decides to open and that person's in limbo and then the applicant has a job lined up at St. Francis and really needs St. Francis really needs the person, but we can't do anything until they get straightened out in mass and that can take a while. So it, it's a again, it's a balancing act. I, I hope I yeah. answered your question. Understood. Thank you. Um, any well, Mr. Carragher, let's move on to Ms. Morris and then see if there are any more questions. Oh, uh, Ms. Jackson, do you want to ask Mr. Carragher something before Ms. Morris? You're you're muted. Sorry. I I, I did. Um, so um, I'm sorry that my phone is ringing in the background. That's why I didn't want to unmute. But uh, okay, so. Um, uh, uh, Everybody, uh, well, some people may know that in June, I believe it was, um, PBS did a, um, a story, um, and um, and it was very unflattering. And it I pointed out that um, that uh, that um, there was a lot of missing information about uh, doctors that were uh, disciplined in other states. In fact, they found that information about disciplinary action or felony charges was missing from the profiles of more than a dozen doctors who are eligible to practice in Connecticut. And it, the story was uh, very, very, very complete. And um, it said that an investigation was going on and that Chris Andreessen said um, that um, that they were years in, in, uh, in, in, in catching up and um, that um, it had, DPH acknowledged that it had failed to update some physician profiles. And it said the task of automatically forwarding all out of state discipline reports to the unit uh, was inadvertently lost in the mix of reassigning tasks following a series of staff staffing changes. And that there was some catch up and investigation going on. Anyway, I won't read uh, ad nauseum from the story, but um, certainly uh, that was kind of a damning story and very well documented uh, in June. And I think um, that certainly um, should be a concern of ours about what's being done now to um, update the files and make sure that Connecticut residents um, uh, can have uh, faith that when they look up the rec the records of Connecticut physicians, that they are up to date and um, and that uh, these doctors are um, you know are uh, um, are appropriately practicing. Anyway, I'll I'll stop there. I'm sorry about the background noise. By the way, I wish I could have turned it off. It, I apologize for that. Yeah, Thank you. No problem. problem. Thank you. I can, I, I can speak to the profile issue and the reporting. And yes, it was due to staff changes, number one. And number two is that we were receiving notification in our investigations unit that another state had taken action against one of our physicians, a, a Connecticut licensed physician. Um, and our investigation, our investigators, and Laura can speak much better to this than I can, but they think about 
the investigation. They don't think of the profile because that's kind of handled in my unit. So it was it was the communication um, issue between the two units, which has drastically gotten better. And I've been going back from cases that we've opened um, based on a report from another state's taken action and going back and updating the profiles of those folks. Um, before we can publish a profile, we have to give the doc uh, 60 days to review the information and dispute the accuracy of it. So it's not like we can just go in, update it and publish it. We need to give the, the, the physician some time to review the information. But we are we are catching up with that. Um, Chris tasked me with being done with that by the end of the year. So thank you, thank you. So bottom line on that, I think for all of us, the the story, the investigative report was helpful in that it brought a problem to light that is now being fixed. So that's good. It's unfortunate it existed, but I'm glad it's in the process of being fixed. So um, Ms. Morris. Hi, good afternoon. Um, uh, I, I'll just touch briefly on the physician profiles as Steve, Steve said, um, you know, we were we are working on getting those all up to date and it is a process and it does take time. Um, that was that was prior to my start here, but um, but I'm happy to assist in getting that um, completed. Um, as far as um, disciplinary action or pending investigations from other states where a, a provider ha, uh, holds a license. Um, and I think this all came about uh, regarding a specific case. Um, and so I just want to touch on that a little bit because um, the department learned about the di this disciplinary action on this particular provider when it received notification in Jan on January 9th of this year. Um, the issue was from the state of, it was issued from the state of Florida, but the date of the order was November, 2022 and didn't actually get to us until January 9th, 23. So, um, you know, we, we have no control over how frequently or quickly other states, um, sort of, uh, uh, have this information in the National Practitioner Database. So I'm not sure what other states do. I know that Connecticut um, is is pretty quick in, in reporting those, but other states um, are different. They may do it quarterly, they may do it monthly. I'm not really sure on the specifics, but this one unfortunately did not get to us until January, even though the order was issued in November of 2022. But with that being said, as soon as we received it, we immediately started that investigation on January 9th and completed it in May of 2023. Um, so as Steve sort of said there, you know, um, you know, we may not receive all the information um, from all the states, especially when, uh, you know, they're applying for licenses here in, in Connecticut, but we do try our best to vet them out as best we can, given um, all the information and the different sites that we can um, research. Thank you. Um, Dr. Wolf? What, what's Connecticut's goal to get things reported to the uh, data bank after adjudication? Steve, I don't know if you know that. I know we, you know, once it's adjudicated, we, I believe we send that out rather quickly. Um, I believe that may be another unit that handles that. And I'm sorry, I don't have that answer. That's just one thing no, I, I'm I, unclear I'm actually, on. I'm actually handling that now since Jeff Cardis left. So we try to get it, you know, hopefully the day after, once we get notified, once it makes its way through the bureaucracy on our end, meaning Tyra gets the MOD, she does what she does, updates her workflow, forwards it down to our license, my unit, the licensing unit, we update the license status, um, and if it's a revocation, the expiration date, and things like that, and then we try to get that reported to the data bank within a few days. I mean, we don't like to wait, um, obviously, because um, it's, it's important information, and it's also a requirement. 
Oh, thank you. Thank you. Is there. Thank you. Are there any other questions or any further information that DPH would like to share with us about this question issue? I, I don't see any further comment or communication about it. So let's move on to the next item of business, which is the motion for reconsideration uh, in Dr. Franco. And uh, I think think, you know, I would. Yes, Dr. Wolf. Uh, just to reiterate, I am recused from any discussion on this subject. Right, right. The record will reflect that and you are recused. All right. So um, I think the way we should handle this is uh, Attorney Lenhart, you can speak no more than 10 minutes, please. And Attorney Fazina and um, then we can entertain the motion, I would guess. I mean, I guess suppose we should put the motion on the record first. So we're talking about something that's before us. Would someone please make a, make a motion to approve oh, the right. motion for reconsideration? Oh. Yes. McEnany makes a motion for reconsider. I'm sorry, I stepped on somebody. Yeah, it's Joe Calico. I made the motion for reconsideration. Okay. I'll second that. Okay. Any seconds. All right. So we're discussing that motion at this point, and Attorney uh, Lenhart, um, you may begin. You're mute. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to present the request for reconsideration. Um, I, as I understand it, this is previously been sent to the members of the board uh, for review, along with my um, reply to the objection to the request. Is that correct? Yes. Has everyone had a chance to look at it? So I'll be brief. Um, essentially, the decision that was issued um, by the board uh, orders my client, Dr. Wayne Franco, to surrender permanently and be permanently restricted his uh, DEA and um, Department of Consumer Protection controlled license registrations, which is an order that Dr. Franco cannot comply with because he voluntarily surrendered those back in December, on December 18th, I believe, I'm sorry, December 19th, 2018. So he can't comply with that order. And that's on page 20 of the decision, the memorandum of decision at paragraph two. Um, and, and the record has ample evidence of that by way of testimony. There was some dialogue in the, in the record um, and also um, documentation as well. And then counsel for the department agreed to stipulate that those had been surrendered. So there's no question about Dr. Franco's inability to comply with the order at paragraph two. Um, the order also is a little bit inconsistent with what's ordered at paragraph six, which allows Dr. Franco to reapply for prescribing controlled substances, registrations and license authority. Uh, after two years after the completion of the probationary period. So in order for Dr. Franco to prescribe controlled substances, he's got to reapply. He's got to get approval from the department, the board, DEA and consumer protection. So because of that, um, my position is that the two paragraphs, um, paragraph two should be deleted, paragraph six should be amended as I've requested and, um, and and then Dr. Franco can comply with the remainder of the orders. Um, there's if, if this request is granted, there's no threat in the practice of medicine by Dr. Franco to the health and safety of any persons, the public. Uh, there's no risk of injury. There's no uh, prejudice to the department because he simply doesn't have those um, controlled substance authorities to surrender. 
So he's being put in an impossible position um, while he wishes to remain respectful to the board with regard to the memorandum of decision and what it has ordered. He just can't comply with these terms, so we ask that the request for reconsideration be granted. I also, with regard to the department's objection, um, I respectfully suggest that I that I'm not sure the objection was filed based on a detailed review of the record, and it wasn't filed by the attorney who was actually in the hearings. So I'm not faulting counsel. I just think that it's um, there was an oversight of some sort to what's actually in the record. And this is a substantial evidence in the record is that both of those uh, registrations were surrendered back in 2018. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney Linhart. Um, Attorney Fazina. Um, yes, thank you. Um, uh, attorney um, Moore Linhart is correct that I was not the attorney of record um, at the time these hearings occurred. Um, but I, I did review whatever transcripts were available to me, and I believe that in my objection, I did make some citations to the transcript. And as far as um, the the reply to the department's objection, and I, I thought I heard uh, Attorney Lenhart indicate today that counsel um, at the time stipulated that the licenses had been surrendered. I, I looked at the portion of the transcript that was cited, and at best, when, when I look at that transcript, it believe I, I believe that the staff attorney assigned to the matter at the time stipulated to the fact that uh, Attorney um, Lenhart was not representing Dr. Franco. Um, in the matter before the Department of Consumer Protection. And I think I, I cited in my objection, um, there were numerous references to a single license that was surrendered. Um, and I, I would also just like to say that I think a, a lot of these um, arguments were already considered at your meeting last month. I believe that they were the same or similar arguments were made in the brief that was filed um, in opposition to the proposed memorandum of decision. Um, so uh, the department believes that the decision um, as, um, a, a, as adopted by the full board at its last meeting should stand. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it, is there um, any other input from other uh, from board members on this? Uh, yes, uh, Matt, can I have some um, questions? Uh, do you have me? Can you hear me? Yes, yes. I just wasn't sure it was you, but you identified yourself. So thank you. And I'm and I'm well, I'm waving too. Um, so I do have some questions. Is there a dispute regarding? Is there a dispute regarding the language that was cited by Miss Leonhardt in her? I think it was a, a um, subsequent uh, memorandum, her her final memorandum. Is there a dispute regarding whether or not those things were said um, by the by the uh, Department of Public Health? I guess I would direct that question to Ms. Fazina. I, I'm not sure that I understand your question. I thought I heard Ms. Lenhart say that the department staff attorney that was assigned to the case at the time stipulated to the fact that Dr. Franco surrendered both his DEA registration and his state of Connecticut DCP registration. And she cited um, the transcript. When I look at the, that portion of the transcript, I, again, I wasn't the staff attorney um, assigned. I wasn't present for any of these proceedings, but it looks to me like wh what's available in the record I have that the staff attorney at the time stipulated to the fact that uh, uh, attorney Donovan, I believe it was, and not attorney Moore Lenhard was representing Dr. Franco in a matter involving his registration with the Connecticut DCP. That's how I read that record. But I, I would defer to the panel members who um, were present for the proceeding uh, on, on that, that issue. Thank you. Did you ask um, a question for me, uh, Ed? Dr. Zeman, uh, is, that, is that Dr. Zeman? Well, I I don't know, Doctor. I mean, you know, I I, I mean, I I wasn't present, obviously, and nor was I present last month um, for the hearing when this was approved. But the the information which seems to be included, and uh, unfortunately, I can't. Seemingly, I can't open both and I can't open the file and be online at the same time, apparently. Maybe it's operator error. But in any event, um, what I read when I looked at it prior to this uh, meeting was um, indicated to me that it was clear that uh, the doctor it himself 
testified that he had surrendered both licenses. Um, am I missing something? Can I um, interrupt here for a minute? Um, Attorney Shapiro, your hand is up. Thank you. Thank you, um, Dan Shapiro from the AG's office. I think, you know, my only look at this is to make sure it's legally sufficient. And I, I think that I have a suggestion that might solve uh, the issue from both uh, parties perspective and the boards. I think with there's two issues. One in paragraph six, I think an easy fix may be to say unless he has already done so within 10 days of the effective date of this order, respondents shall surrender to the issuing authorities. And so if he's done it, he's already complied with it. And if he hasn't, he needs to do it. The other issue is that I think there is some inconsistency between paragraph two and paragraph six. So if the change was made to six and it says, unless he's already done so, he shall surrender these. Then there's other terms that he shall not reapply for two years. And then prior to to reapplying, he shall take a course uh, in pres uh, in prescription of controlled <clears throat> substances pre approved by the board. That seems inconsistent with paragraph two that says it's permanently restricted. So I think that if the board is interested I think the board needs to make a choice between two and six. So if the board thinks that six is sufficient, I think to make the decision legally sound, it should say unless he has already done so, and then the rest of paragraph six, and then the board can remove two, and it still has the same effect because he doesn't have his prescribing abilities for at least two years, and prior to reapplying, he must comply with the board's order which requires him to take this course approved by the board. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I, Mr. Cole, have, as, uh, Mr. McInerney, I'm sorry. I'm, let me hear from, or let us hear from Mr. Cole, that, that, who was on the panel for that uh, matter. Okie dokie, sorry. It's okay. There. Mr. Cole, have. I forgot to unmute. I forgot to unmute. I took You're my there. hand down but forgot to unmute. This is Cole Hip, sorry. Um, so I would be comfortable with Attorney Shapiro's uh, edit to the beginning of paragraph six. I think that makes sense. We specifically as a panel had the discussion about the inconsistency between paragraph two and paragraph six. And we were told that while you can say it's permanently restricted, there needs to be an opportunity to appeal that or to come back to that. So if that guidance wasn't true, then clearly we can get rid of two. I, that's my recollection of why we um, had that inconsistency. Uh, we specifically wanted to make sure that if it was a possibility that Dr. Franco could come back, that we needed to have steps taken so that he just didn't apply in the in the and the Department of Public Health didn't know about it. Um, so that was why. So if, Dr. if Attorney Shapiro says we need to change the inconsistency, I think that's that guidance is just expands on what we heard earlier. Thank you. Yeah, and, uh, may I ask Dr. Zeman, I know you were trying to speak here and I kept cutting you off. I'm sorry. No, I, no, I have nothing. I had nothing further to say. Okay. Um, Attorney Shapiro. Okay. Oh, or Mr. McEnany. I don't know who. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I'll just uh, jump in. Um, I didn't hear what most of Mr. Cole had said, but unfortunately I was lost. But um, the suggestions made by, if I understand it correctly, the suggestions made by Mr. Shapiro uh, as to if he hasn't already done it, that sounds like a good um, way to address that. And if I understood the tail end of Mr. Kohlhepp's um, remarks, that the 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 that if the doctor can, Dr. Franco, I think it is, can come back, uh, he has to take certain steps. So that would argue, I guess, for six and elimination of the the permanent language in two. 
So okay. That sounds like okay. a good. That sounds like a good result from my perspective. Okay. Um, Attorney Shapiro, can you um, summarize what you think, given well, all this input? We should yeah, do. Yeah, I think. To... I think that the the easiest way, given what I've heard from the board, you can make a motion, and okay. someone can make a motion, and and the board can uh, discuss and vote on it. But I think the motion is in paragraph six at the very beginning to add the phrase unless he has already done so and then keep six the rest of six as it is and to remove uh paragraph two and renumber accordingly so that would be the motion if a member of the board wants to make it and i think that that would uh clear up any legal insufficiencies okay we have on the floor already the motion to reconsider so i think we should do that first and then move to your motion um so let me ask on the motion to reconsider i know that attorney wolf is recused from it is there anyone else who is recused from voting on that motion all right is there anyone opposed to granting the motion to reconsider and then we can say what move to the next motion after that and have a motion as to what we're reconsidering or what we think should be done with the reconsideration. Uh, Mr. Cole, have your hand was up. Was that? I, I, I was looking to make a motion. <laughs> so I jumped in too soon. Sorry. Uh, OK, all right. All right. Is there anyone opposed to approving the, the motion for reconsideration? All right, I don't see any op opposition, so I will entertain now the next motion. If you, you would like oh, to make it. But. Yes, this is a call up uh, in terms of the memorandum of decision for uh, Dr. Wayne Franco. I would recommend that we edit paragraph six to say in the first line, unless he has already done so, comma, and then continue within 10 days. Well, and I recommend that we delete paragraph two and renumber the subsequent paragraphs. Um, Mackin, any seconds that motion by Mr. Colehub? Okay. Is there any discussion of that motion? Uh, Kathy, Joe Calico here. Yes, Mr. Calico. Uh, the question I have is. Uh, would that satisfy the attorney for Dr. Franco and 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 the, the attorney for the state. <laughs> That's very considerate of you. Uh, <laughs> is there I it, let me ask this. Uh, let me do it a different way. Is there any objection that either of them would like to raise with us before we uh, vote on this second motion? I do not have an objection. Thank you. I appreciate the okay. consideration. OK, and uh, attorney Fazina. Uh, thank you. I also have no objection to the proposed changes. OK, all right. So on this motion, is there any other discussion? All right. Uh, Dr. Wolf is recused. Is there anyone else recused for voting on this motion? All right. Is there anyone opposed to granting this motion? I don't see any responses, so that motion will be uh, granted unanimously with Dr. Wolf um, recused. Both motions, actually. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Much. Thank you. All right. Our next item on the agenda is Dr. Krug. And may I have a motion to approve the consent proposed consent order and so move by motion to approve. okay is there a second second okay okay thank you the, um all right so um attorney fazina are you um representing the department on this motion uh, i mean this consent order um, yes, I am. Um, and I believe uh, attorney Leg niece and her client are in attendance. OK, let me before you start, I see Dr. Wolf has his hand up, so. I am recused from this one as well. OK, thank you, Dr. Wolf. Appreciate that. The record will so reflect. 
All right. Um, Attorney uh, Fazina, could you please give us a thumbnail orientation to this, please? Um, yeah, just briefly, uh, you received a, a proposed consent order and cover sheet in this matter. Um, this involves allegations uh, concerning um, boundary violations with a former patient. The proposed discipline includes a reprimand, a $20,000 civil penalty, and there's also um, a whereas clause. I believe that um, respondent has previously completed um, a 46 credit hour course in ethics and boundaries. And the okay. parties um, respectfully request that um, you uh, approve the proposed consent order. Thank you. Thank you. And Attorney Lagnis, would you like to be heard on this? I don't see you here. I don't hear you. So I assume we should uh, proceed. Um, um, she sent she sent me an email saying that that they were um, present. So I'm not sure what happened. Yeah, yeah I, I thought see, I, I saw. Yeah, I do see her. Um, attorney Lagnes, I'm not sure if you're muted. Well, let me do this. I know that uh, Dr. Risi um, has his hand up, so I will hear from Dr. Risi if attorney Lagnes wants to. Uh, communicate with us, find a way to let us know. Okay, Dr. Risi. Yeah, I participated in a pre-hearing conference regarding this case, and uh, Attorney Shapiro suggested that I be available if there are questions about that, that pre-hearing conference and the conclusions that were reached. Right, and I did no notice that there was a waiver of any objection to your telling us whatever your thoughts may be, so by all parties. All right, um, do you, uh, Ms. Jacqueline. Yes, thank you. Um, if I understand this case correctly, Dr. Krug is um, alleged to have engaged in a romantic relationship with a patient while she was still a patient. And the um, proposed penalty is a $20,000 fine. Um, last month, we um, had a case before us of Dr. Kessler, who had um, engaged in a romantic relationship with a patient while she was still a patient of his. And the penalty that we approved was a one year suspension of his license and a period of probation in addition to a fine. And so if these are these cases um, and the behavior is in any way comparable, my question is why um, are the disciplinary actions that we are endorsing so different and the standards so different, why would we not impose a one-year suspension of Dr. Krug's license if he indeed engaged in a romantic relationship with a woman who was his patient? Um, that would be my question to Dr. Reesing and indeed to the board. Thank you. Um, um, uh, Dr. Reesing, you- I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, it looks like um, um, Attorney Lagnice sent a message to the chat that she can't get in. So I, I would ask that we wait for her to be able to join the meeting. Okay. All right. Well, um, we I am can wait communicating a her, with her and trying to assist. Okay. There's somebody on a phone in the lobby. Maybe that's she. Hello. Is, hello. Is, is this Hello. Attorney Legnese? Oh, yes. Okay. Um, yes. Okay. Okay. Um, yes. Okay. I I apologize. I am trying. I've been trying to get in since you invited me to join. 
um, and there's a huge echo here. Um, and there's a huge echo trying to. Are, 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 you let me, are you on your computer as well as your phone? Are you? Yes. Oh, let's mute that. If you get out off your computer and only talk to us on your phone, the echo should go away. Is that better? I'm sorry. I'm, I'm yes. not very technologically astute, but um, thank you for the opportunity to speak. And I would like you folks to hear from Dr. Risi because he, um, we spent a fair amount of time, and I know he has exhaustively reviewed the file in this case. Um, this, this matter was extensively investigated by the department in great detail, and there's a very fairly long history here, but suffice it to say that after their investigation, uh, a compliance conference that lasted for over eight hours where seven, seven witnesses testified uh, in order to provide complete context for the situation, um, this is a physician who um, has no pattern of misconduct whatsoever. Um, the physician has no history of prior disciplinary actions. His conduct was not in any way based on a dishonest or selfish motive. Uh, as a matter of fact, at the time, while in retrospect he was incorrect, what he did for the patient was in his view necessary to assist her in what he considered to be fairly exigent circumstances. I'm not going to get into all of the, the, the nitty gritty there, but that is essentially what the department came to understand after hearing from the witnesses. And also we, we had an ethicist, one of the state's leading ethicists, um, who is actually a Yukon uh, physician, Jane Grant Kells, who provided a detailed opinion um, indicating that she felt that the um, that the actions that were undertaken, they were two two fairly benign actions during the time of a romantic relationship, did not rise to the level of a even a boundary violation. Now that said, um, and Dr. Crew was extremely you know obviously troubled at these accusations, spent 46 hours in a boundary violation course. Um, received psychiatric treatment by a psychiatrist who, who, who actually also provided an opinion letter indicating that the physician, that Dr. Crew was at no risk to any other patient. And so when one considers all of the variables in their context, I mean, he acknowledged in retrospect that what he did, he should not have done, that it was an error of judgment. Um, he owned up to it. And I think that the, the um, and even the department, after being exposed to all of this information, felt similarly that um, under these, and every case, you know, I, I understand that you, you look at matters and try to compare cases, but there are no cases of this nature that are, that are similar. Every case really requires a discrete context. And when all of the variables and all of the context was considered in this particular case, under these specific circumstances, um, the department felt that this was an appropriate um, disposition, and uh, Dr. Krug has accepted that uh, in agreement with the department. And um, you know, I would strongly advocate that that the department and the board uh, accept this. Um, but again, I would I would be interested in in having Dr. Reese because we've. Once we had our comp compliance conference with him, we um, we waived any issue regarding his his ability to weigh in. We've been very transparent about this from the beginning. Um, Dr. Krug is very anxious to get back to take care of the, the he, he, he's a physiatrist who takes care of the disabled citizens of our state um, and is anxious to get back doing that. And we think that this consent order um, is a significant penalty for him, and it's and but but is certainly under the circumstances um, appropriate, and that further discipline beyond this is just not warranted. Thank you, um, Dr. Wolf. I see you have your hand up. Yeah, uh, by uh, Dr. Green just asked me to let you know that he is recused as well. Uh, thank you. Okay. Appreciate that. Um, all right, uh, Dr. Risi, I think it would be helpful to 
well, have some input from you. Yeah, I, I'm mindful of the fact that we should not be having a hearing at the at the board meeting uh, and going into the details of the case. But I just want to let you know that I did review all the available materials and then met at some length uh, with Attorney Shapiro, uh, Dr. Krug, and the attorneys for the department and for the doctor. Uh, we concluded that the department did prove the allegations regarding the inappropriate doctor-patient relationship and the boundary transgressions uh, and felt, therefore, that the proposed uh, reprimand, fine, and already completed coursework would be appropriate. Um, but um, we had an extensive discussion along the lines of what Ms. Jackson ra Jacqueline raised as a concern. And uh, we felt that this case is different from the previously discussed case and do not believe that there is a risk to patients or to the public so that further license restrictions would not really serve any any purpose. Uh, so that's that's why we ended up where we did. Thank you. Um, Dr. Wolf, I don't know if your hand's still up because you had something else or you. Okay, is there anything else? Any other board member who would like to add to this discussion? Yes, Dr. Zeman. Only that I was unable to read the uh, information sent to us on this case because for some reason it expanded beyond the, ra the range of my screen. So, uh, but I'm certainly uh, respectful and listening carefully uh, to Dr. Reese and attorney like niece. Okay. Um, all right. Is there anyone else who would like to say something? All right. I assume Dr. Okay. Thank you. All right, I don't see any other hands up or hear any other comments. Um, and at this point, we have um, two members of the board who are recused, Dr. Wolf and Dr. Green. And I see Dr. Reese's hands up. Yeah, I don't know if um, since I participated in the pre hearing, I should abstain from voting or not. No, I think it, the, you're. Permitted to vote. I think uh, the waiver that was signed said you're permitted to discuss all details you know and to participate fully. Okay, thank you. Um, all right. Is there anyone else? <laughs> okay, so with the two doc doctors on the board who I indicated who have been are are recused from voting on this matter, among all the other board members, is there? Anyone who is opposed to granting, granting the, the consent, consent order. order. Yeah, yes, this is Michelle Jacqueline. I am opposed. Okay. Okay. And, and in that in case, that we case, need to we have, need have, to have, have a, 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 for some reason, I have to have feedback, feedback on here. Is everyone muted? Everyone muted? Okay. Um, Tyra, can you please do a roll call vote? Yes. Uh, Mr. Andrews. Andrews approves. Uh, Dr. Duffy. Approved. Dr. Um, uh, Mr. Calico. Joe, if you can unmute. Approved. Uh, Ms. Katz? Dr. Katz. Or Dr. Katz, I'm sorry. Thank you, Dr. Katz. Mr. Colhep? Colhep approves. Mr. McEnany? McEnany approves. Dr. Reese? Reese approve. Dr. Schwinn? Approve. Dr. Sawyer? Dr. Sawyer, Sawyer. Dr. Yuan? Dr. Yuan? Dr. Zeman? Dr. Zeman? Approved. 
Dr. Lee. Dr. Lee. Dean Miss Emma. Miss Emma. Approve. Approve. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, the, the, the consent. Uh, 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 this is Michelle Jacqueline. I don't think my name was called. Oh, oh. Well, well. Well, you've well, been you've recorded, been recorded as, opposed, as opposed, I think. Okay, well, I am. <laughs> okay, I okay, think that's I think probably, that's probably why. why. Okay. Yes, thank um, you, Ms. Jacqueline. Yeah, so I can't. Um, we're so at the okay, end sorry. of our meeting. The, mo the motion, the consent order is approved uh, with the indicated vote. Um, we're at the end of our agenda. Um, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. We see. Yeah, Dr. Zeman moves to adjourn. Okay, well, one of you is seconding, but I don't think we need a vote. In any case, uh, we will adjourn now and thank you all very much. Um, and we will continue on our quest to get the best meeting set up we can that helps, you know, all people's concerns. So thank you very much and see you in a month. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.